Hi, Jay Smith here again. This is a follow-up to a live stream that Hatun and I did earlier this week. Hatun and I wanted to look at the coins and we were really looking at these articles that are now coming out and the, uh, the galleries of the coins there at the British Museum, which Hatun and I went and looked at back in September of last year. And it really hit our fancy because suddenly we realized when you look at those coins that they had in the galleries, in the Islamic galleries, uh, they were not really telling the whole story. They weren't going and unpacking the significance of the coins. Now, one of the things that we've always had a problem with uh, when we look at the history of Islam, when we look at the beginning of Islam, those those years of the, what they call the rightly guided caliphs, which include Muhammad as well. Before that, the four rightly guided caliphs that come right after Muhammad. The biggest problem we've had historically is we just don't have anything from that period. We have nothing to look at. There's nothing written from Arab sources of Muhammad, of the city of Mecca, of this whole story that follows him moving from Mecca to Medina, of him receiving a book called the Quran, of any of this, what what should be the most important part of Islamic history, the very beginning part of Islamic history, which has only happened 1400 years ago, a very short time when we're talking about history. And there should be enormous amount of material that should be written about this man, about who he is, what he said, what he did, where he went, all the things that happened in that first initial period of Islam that started when the Khilafat was inaugurated in 620, really 624 would be when it was inaugurated, right up until 661. So from that period of 624 up until 620, 661, roughly 40 years, there should be some kind of material there. And there isn't. There's nothing. We can't find anything. The first time we hear any uh, of any uh, writings about his life are what we know as the Siratul Rasulullah, written by Ibn Isham in 833, Al-Waqiri in 835. The first time we hear of the sayings of Muhammad don't appear until 870 by Al-Buhari. Then we have Muslim, Tirmidhi, Daud, and others that follow him after that. But nothing from the time when Muhammad lived. Nothing from this time when this caliphate was being inaugurated, except now we do. Huge frustration up to this time, but now we have something we can look at. Coins. Coins. I love coins. Well, we all love coins, don't we? Because you can buy things with coins. You can barter with coins. Coins are used much more for just bartering, though. Coins are minted by rulers to announce who they are. Coins have reference to who is in charge. And because of the fact in the 7th century they didn't have radio, they didn't have television, they didn't have newspapers, they used coins. Coins were what was used to then say, this is the person in power, and this is the date of that coins mint, and in many cases where it was minted. And the other thing they would do with coins is they would then give a, especially ancient coins, not modern day coins, but ancient coins, especially this time period in the seventh century, they would announce which religion they followed, which religion, which God they worship. So they would put their name, the date, the place the mint was made, and then they would announce who their God is or what uh, religion they belong to. And they would give a symbol of that religion. And in the seventh century, the two biggest religions that existed at that time in that part of the world, in the Middle East, were the Byzantines, the, who were Christian, and the Sassanians, who were the Sassanians, who were Persians. And so because of that, we're going to look at that time period, and we're going to look at the coins that they minted. Since we can't find anything else, we can't find any documents from that time period, we can't find artifacts that announce who these caliphs are, like Abu Bakr from 632 to 634, Umar who ruled from 634 to 644, Uthman that came into power from 644 to 656, and then Ali, the last of the fourth rightly guided caliph, who then ruled from 656 to 661. When then Mu'awiyah comes into power, and Mu'awiyah is highly important, we're going to talk more about him with these coins. So let's go back and let's take a look and let's see what coins we have 
and I'll be using a lot that's coming from these articles. We'll be looking a lot that has come from also from the internet that I've pulled down and books that have been written. I'll be referring to them, but let's just go through and let's look at these coins. And let's look at this one here. Now, this is the first coin. Take a look at it and you will see it is a Byzantine solidus. Uh, the Byzantines who ruled in the north and the west of part of the Arabia, uh, what we know, the, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, that whole swath of land that includes to what today would be Egypt and, of course, Israel, as you move up the coast, Lebanon, Syria, on up through Turkey, and then on over to the west. That was the Byzantine area, and uh, they, were, they were the ones that were the Christians at that time. Now, meanwhile, there was another big empire known as the Sassanids, and the, they were Persian. Their religion would have been Zoroastrianism. And they were in the eastern part of the what then later became the Arab Empire, and they did not have solidus. They would have had they would have had silver coins. But let's look at these the solidus that you see here. Take a look at the solidus, and you will notice that on the obverse, that means the front side, uh, you have a golden image of the Emperor Heraclius. He ruled from 610 to 641. Those are his two sons on either side, Constantine and Heraclitus. Heraclitus, uh, the, both two sons of Heraclitus. Notice what they have in their hands. They have an orb, and there's a cross above the orb. That cross proves that they're Christian. That's their image. On the back side, which would be the reverse of that coin, uh, you have a Byzantine cross, and you can see the Byzantine cross there, and it has a pedestal, and it was written in either Greek or Latin. Uh, some dispute that, but if you can see that, you can see that it is distinctly a cross on four pedestals. But proving that at this period, this was all Christian, and this was the coin that was used right up until the 660s, when then 661, when Mu'awiyah comes to power. Now, Here's the big problem. Why is it during that whole period that you have this coin, you don't have any Islamic coins? Because we do know that Islam came to power in 624 when, according to Islamic tradition, that from the traditions that appear in the 9th and 10th century, you do have, uh, well, you have the whole central part of the Arabian Peninsula known as the Hijaz. And I'm gonna put up a map here. I want you to look at this map. Because this map shows you what we're talking about. You can see the brown area. Look at Mecca and Medina. That whole brown area is the area that Islam controlled at the time of the Prophet's death in 632. That brown area, and a little bit over in Oman, you can see a little tip of it in Oman, that's their control. They controlled all that area up until 632. Now you might say, well, that's not that big an area, so therefore they wouldn't be able to have much coinage. They would have to use whatever is around them. But they didn't stay there. And then you look in the orange area. See the orange area that includes Syria, includes Egypt, it includes Iraq, it includes Iran, it includes Baluchistan, all the way over to Afghanistan and almost and all of the Arabian Peninsula. And then going to the west, it continue, goes all the way up over to Tripoli up until 661. So this is the time of the rightly guided caliph from 632 to 661, there, the frontiers of Islam really expanded. Look at all these countries that came under their control. Much of them are, well, the whole part area over to the right or to the east would be the Sassanid area. They just destroyed the Sassanids. They took over these great cities of Baghdad, ba uh, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. Uh, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo would be where the, where the Byzantines controlled. So they pushed the Byzantines back and they pushed the Sassanids back. And they then took over the control of these great cities moving right across from Cairo all the way over to Tripoli in the west, moving across from Baghdad and to Isfahan and to Merv and to Herat, and all the way almost over it, almost touching Afghanistan in the east. That was their control. So the question is, where are the coins? Why don't they have coins? If they control that much of the land, and now they were the new rulers, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, why didn't they mint coins? That's what you do. That's how you announce yourself. This is the tradition of every conqueror. The first thing you do is mint their own coins, put their faces on it, put their name on it, and put their religion on it.
We can't find it. Well, first of all, we should, uh, I mean, it, every Muslim knows that Muhammad existed, and uh, it's common uh, knowledge that there was a man named Muhammad who was the founder of the Islamic religion, even mm -hmm. among non-Muslims. Uh, so we should now be asking the reverse question, why does this man think that Muhammad did not exist and that Muslims invented him? Mm -hmm. And w are there other people who think that? Because he claims to be building on scholarly sources. Um, that exists. So what is he referring yes. to? In, in every field of inquiry, there, there is a mainstream scholarship and then there is fringe scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mainstream scholarship on, um, on Islam uh, would uh, include Muslim mainstream scholarship, but it would also include uh, non-Muslim mainstream scholarship. So in other words, among Orientalists, uh, Europeans who have uh, studied the, the religions of the East and uh, cultures and civilizations of the East, uh, you have uh, a, a stream of academic scholars who have been studying Islam for a couple of hundred years now. And uh, uh, they have developed sort of consensus, uh, an idea about ho how Islam originated and developed and, and eventually uh, reached the uh, stage that we know now to be Islam. And, and they generally say that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did exist. He was a historical person, but that Muslims made more of him than he actually was. And mm. they invented things, put things in his mouth and so on in terms of the Hadith collections. But when it comes to the Quran, uh, a certain scholar, Theodore Noldek, uh, from more than 100 years ago, uh, uh, described the collection of the Quran in the time of Uthman, the third caliph of Islam, as uh, basically authentic and that uh, many different readings of the Quran are known and they all go back to that uh, core book which was uh, promulgated in the time of the third Caliph Uthman and this was within two decades after the death of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so the Quran is authentic uh, though not all hadiths are authentic so the hadith okay. collections would have so the Quran isn't something that was invented later on it was something that you know is actually from the time that Muslims claim it to be exactly okay so now uh, so that's mainstream scholarship mm -hmm. in this case uh, there is a confluence of Muslim and non-Muslim scholarship the difference is that Muslim scholarship would insist that the Quran was collected not only in the time of Uthman but even before that during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr mm -hmm. and that Uthman just simply made copies and sent them out to various parts of the Muslim Empire Nevertheless, even if the European consensus is correct that uh, the Quran that we have now goes back to the Caliph Uthman, to Muslims this is still dependable because uh, now we have a book which was put into writing by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him because within two decades of his death we have not only Uthman who was a companion but Zaid who is said to have co uh, uh, headed the commission to collect the pieces and put them together as the Quran. He's a companion of the Prophet and this was done in the presence of many, many other known uh, and respectable companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So it would be like the equivalent of saying we have a book which was put together by the remaining 11 disciples of Jesus and add Matthias to make it 12. Mm -hmm. So these 12 disciples put together this document so we know that this is, these are the teachings of Jesus because the disciples wouldn't lie. They're telling us firsthand what they saw Jesus say and do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we have uh, in, in the Islamic context now something similar which now the European scholars say we have a book which was composed by companions of the Prophet peace be upon him within that that early period uh, then and, and they themselves also being careful not to record what they thought and what they would like to write but uh, to just simply recollect what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught them and to put them in this book, and this is the book of God, well then, to Muslims, this is quite dependable. And that's the mainstream scholarship. So you, you've mentioned Jesus, and, mm -hmm. and, and the question is, how does, how does uh, the historical record about Muhammad, about the Quran and Islam, because they're all related, how does that relate to the historical record of other uh, religious figures, perhaps, or of other historical important events? Well, if we, if we think of the Prophet Jesus then, um, uh, let's think about what Robert Spencer himself um, describes. Uh, he, he talks about the uh, historical inquiry into the life of Jesus and so on, and he's mm -hmm. asking, well, why couldn't we make the same kind of inquiry about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Mm -hmm. And he's right. Well, why should the Prophet Muhammad be excluded from this kind of historical inquiry? We should investigate everybody, the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Krishna, uh, anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, 
who is taken to be a, a revered or a holy figure or an important person uh, to be emulated and followed, uh, our hi historical curiosity should take us there. We want to find out who were these persons before somebody made them into a myth or into a hero. Uh, so, so the inquiry, uh, the, the inquiring, to have an inquiring mind is, is, uh, is a good thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the results of all inquiry uh, are, are beneficial or dependable. Uh, sometimes people take their research in directions, that perhaps sometimes they're motivated by personal interest, uh, which takes them beyond uh, the uh, confines of uh, uh, academic disinterest and, and neutrality and objectivity. And this is what I think has happened in the case of uh, Robert Spencer. Mm -hmm. So in any case... So the question is, is what we know of Mohammed dependable compared to what we know of other historical figures? Yes, so that's much, much more dependable. And okay. uh, he himself in his book uh, admits that the Gospels that we have of Jesus were comp uh, compiled within uh, 40 to 60 years after the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So that means in the late decades of the first century. And in, you say 40 years for the first and earliest of the four Gospels, that means that for 40 years, uh, the Christian community did not have these written documents. So how did they think about Jesus? How did they recollect his words? How did they preach about him? And then um, uh, Christian scholars generally say that uh, the Gospels as they now are written uh, recollect not only what Jesus said, but the, how he was being preached about within mm -hmm. those, uh, that, that 40 year gap. Uh, so, it, by comparison, uh, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, giving us the Quran uh, from the time of Uthman, uh, are giving us not the preaching of, of the community, but the precise words which they memorized uh, and, and wrote down from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So that's very different because it, we, we do not have on record that anyone went about in the early decades of the first century. Uh, uh, memorizing the the actual words of Jesus and this is why we have so often the same words represented in different ways in the four Gospels mm -hmm. because people captured the gist of what he said without uh, memorizing the precise words so then why does he think that uh, the Prophet Muhammad is invented? I think this is the most important question. Yeah, and uh, he points question. to like bio biographical information and says that it, it came 125 years after Muhammad's death. He points to some coinage, inscriptions, things like that that don't reference Muhammad. So maybe you can comment on yes. some of those things. So I started uh, referring to the fringe scholarship. Mm -hmm. in, in arguing the matter in that way, he's pursuing uh, uh, lines of argument uh, presented by a fringe scholarship. And uh, more than this, actually, he is putting together a mishmash of ideas that came from various scholars who each in their own way is on a fringe. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these ideas, in fact, were abandoned by some of the protagonists uh, who, who first put out these ideas. And he's still citing them as the authorities behind, uh, who, who stand behind these ideas. Mm -hmm. l let me give an example. Uh, for example, he would say that uh, there is no mention of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the f uh, early coins which were minted in mm -hmm. the Umayyad uh, dynasty. Uh, well, th that's true. But, but what is the uh, reason for this absence of the mention of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Well, uh, a, a certain uh, scholar writing uh, in the collection by Angela uh, uh, Neuwart uh, and others uh, entitled The Quran in Context, um, Heidemann, Heidemann writes uh, about these coins that uh, the, uh, the early Umayyad caliphs did not find it necessary to produce their own coins. They were just simply using coins that were already available from, from the uh, Roman uh, Empire. Uh, and though they established their own Islamic State, they didn't see that it was necessary to have an empire, mm -hmm. a, an Islamic empire that mints its own coins. And uh, uh, later on, when they will try to mint their own coins, they found from experience that they minted a gold coin, for example, and because it did not bear a cross, uh, it could not become popular among Christians. And they wanted the coins which were already in use and which were already popular. There was no need to change them. So what uh, these um, fringe scholars are, are saying now is that look at these coins. They are more like Christian coins than Muslim coins. And that means that Islam as a religion did not really quite exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe Muslims were a sort of Christian at this time and, and Islam would really come later. And when they uh, come up with the idea of Islam, then they would invent its founder, the Prophet Muhammad. 
But this kind of conspiracy theory uh, uh, requires first rejecting uh, the Islamic evidence and, and start with a blank slate and then just coming up with some ideas based on some clues here and, and there. But we cannot do history like this. Uh, you mentioned the biography. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is true that uh, biographies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were written some 125 years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The earliest one we know now, or we have in our hands, is that by Ibn Ishaq, as edited by Ibn Hisham later. Uh, but uh, there were also biographies written earlier, at least uh, some compilation uh, of information regarding some of his expeditions, the Prophet, peace be upon him's expeditions, such as by Musa ibn Uqba. And some scholars have done some detailed studies on this recently, such as Gregor Scholler, and they have shown that, in fact, uh, there is some reliable information within the biography. So you cannot just simply throw out all of the biographies. It is true that the biographies contain some later myths and legends and so on as well, which you have to be wary of. But that does not mean that you throw out the baby with the bathwater and you, you don't take any of the core information. William Montgomery Watt as well has argued along similar lines and showed that in fact uh, uh, it, it, there must have been some dependable information. When for example a battle has been fought and there are slain uh, soldiers and uh, there are family members now celebrating that we are the descendants of those slain soldiers and there are many such persons. Now you cannot discount all of them. There could be some false claimants but the basic idea that there are fallen soldiers and we are the descendants that is a basic historical fact. Uh, and many other scholars like Michael Lecker, for example, in uh, the Cambridge Companion to Muhammad, uh, writes that uh, there, there is a historical core which we can definitely um, decipher. Uh, Robert Spencer also relies on um, uh, Michael Cook uh, and, and, um, uh, and Patricia Crone. But Patricia Crone and Michael Cook, though advancing some of these ideas in, in their book Hagarism, in which they first threw out all of the material from, from Islamic sources and they went with information that they can glean from other such circumstantial evidence like coins and so on, uh, they first advanced this idea that Islam came later and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was invented in retrospect. But they have uh, since then uh, rejected the very idea. And now it is very strange that Robert Spencer are referring to these as the scholars who stand behind this idea. They no longer stand behind this idea. They have discounted this idea. So con to conclude then, Muhammad did exist. Yes, to yes. And, and according and to many. According to Muslim scholars and according to uh, the consensus of non-Muslim orientalist uh, academic scholars. All right. Thank you for that, Brother Shapir. Oh, you're welcome.